All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Free For All. I'm your host, Big John, and I'm excited today. We have a great topic to discuss, and I'm joined by three very capable and interesting men here to go over the topic of immigration, Title 42, lots of good stuff ahead. First and foremost on my list to introduce is my friend and co-host, Mr. Bob Zadek. Bob is a renowned radio personality, ladies and gentlemen, and libertarian broadcasting legend. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to also say he has a new book out. It's called Make Immigration Legal Again, Challenging Assumptions and Advocating for the Founder's Original Immigration Policy of Open Borders. Bob, I love the fact that you wrote a book on immigration. I hate the fact that you made me read that long title, though. you got to give me some sort of shorthand next time. Uh, thank you for having me join you again on the show. I'm looking forward to it. And I think the audience will discover that we are, believe it or not, about to enter, unknowing to all Americans, the golden age of immigration. David and Mark, um, you will see, we will see if you will agree with me or not. Okay, that's a nice tease. That's what we call a, a tease in the business, ladies and gentlemen. And Bob just did an excellent job of that. Also joining us today, two very special guests. Let me start off with Mr. David Beer. David is the Associate Director of Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute. He is considered an expert on legal immigration, border security, and interior enforcement. And I know he's also helped uh, in terms of legislature, having crafted some legislative positions for members of Congress. David, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. Okay. Great to have you. Also joining us, Mr. Mark Krikorian. Uh, he is the executive director of the Center of Immigration for Immigration Studies, rather, uh, and he's a nationally recognized expert on immigration issues. Uh, Mr. Krikorian is also an author, much like Bob, on the issue of immigration. He has a few books out, The New Case Against Immigration, both legal, uh, both legal and illegal. He also is the author of How Obama is Transforming America Through Immigration, and his most recent publication is Open Immigration, Yay and Nay, and that's co-authored uh, with Alex Naraste. Did I pronounce that correctly? No. Narasta is how he says Narasta. It. Okay. I apologize to Mr. Narasta for my mispronounced butchering of his name. But all right, gentlemen, glad to have everyone here for this uh, panel discussion. And let's start off with what's in the news, Title 42. Uh, it... Uh, this was an immigration policy established in March 2020 uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, uh, which resulted in almost 3 million people uh, being returned. Now, that's expired. The Biden uh, administration has lifted Title 42 and has implemented some new policies and faced, uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion, disinformation floating around, as is the case seemingly for just about every issue nowadays in this country. Um, why don't we start off with uh, David. David, can you give us a little summary of Title 42? Like what's replacing it now, the Biden administration? And also, well, David, also, David, before you do, uh, since Title 42 was uh, utterly hip, uh, it was total hypocrisy. It was it, it was adopted under a pretense. Just remind us. What or what Title Forty Two was supposed to do? What was the pretense, and what did it actually accomplish, and why? Well, the, the statute Title Forty Two says it's allowed to block people from introducing a disease to the United States, and so in March, twenty twenty, the Centers for Disease Control were forced, essentially, by the Trump White House to issue an order saying that we're going to suspend the entry of people into the country uh, who don't have prior authorization to travel here and, and then allow Department of Homeland Security officials to then deport them essentially to Mexico um, for the most part, as well as to their home countries in some cases. So that was the, the underlying basis. The CDC uh, 
experts never really agreed that this was going to be a good way to combat COVID. And of course, the disease had already been introduced into the United States. So the underlying rationale there was always a bit shaky. Um, in practice, uh, the, the way it worked out in practice is if someone crossed the border illegally, then Border Patrol would apprehend them and put them on a bus and transport them uh, for the most part back to Mexico. The, as, as far as what's replacing it, well, there's a lot of different things going on on immigration at any given time. But the, the main goal of the current uh, administration is to replicate Title 42 to the greatest extent it can by banning asylum for people who cross the border illegally. And then they have a deal with Mexico to once again take people subject to that ban and send them back to Mexico. Now, in practice, there's lots of practical obstacles to always being able to process people quickly enough to kick them out. But that's, in effect, the goal. And he's paired that, fortunately, I think, from my perspective, he's paired that with some programs that allow at least some people the opportunity to legally come into the country, whether by applying through a phone app uh, to request an appointment at a port of entry or legal crossing point into the United States at the U.S.-Mexico border, or in the case of Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans, they can actually apply to travel legally to the United States if they have a financial sponsor uh, in the United States who's a legal resident. And so those countries have a, a different path. And then you have this phone app opportunity. Both are constrained by a cap. Uh, 30,000 in both cases per month are permitted to enter legally. And the rest have the choice of uh, either being homeless in Mexico or be subject to further predation in their home countries or come to the border illegally. And uh, so some people continue to cross illegally, even though there's these other paths available. Now, David, just a few of the um, questions or points that I'd like to ask either you or Mark to make, just to put today's discussion in a context which the audience can follow. Number one, um, the political cover for Title 42 was COVID, but it's not as if they took every illegal, every border crosser and tested them and said, okay, you have no COVID, you can come in, But which is what one would think enforcement of that statute ought to do, but they didn't because it was just political cover to take everybody in gross and keep them out. It was just border policy disguised as health policy. I, I, just an observation. But, I, I would agree with that. And I would note, yeah, there's no option to get tested before you show up at the border. There was no vaccination exception uh, to Title 42. It was a sham from the beginning. And certainly by the end, it was obviously a sham. Title 42, uh, COVID-19 is not going anywhere in the United States with or without migration. Now this separate, issue, separate issue should be dealt with completely separately. By the end, it was clear for everyone this was a conversation about border security issues and nothing to do with COVID. Now, the, the, and the next point, perhaps uh, input from Mark as well as from David, uh, is when you described the post-Title 42 regime. You know, as you were speaking, it sure sounded like you were describing a new immigration statute. It sure sounded that way to me. So this was just legislation by executive fiat. It read like it when I listened to it, it sounded like it was a statute. There was no uh, legislative predicate. There was no specific grant of power for Biden to do this. It was like we have now repealed the legislative branch of government and maybe deservedly so but at least insofar as immigration is concerned. Is that an oversimplification, uh, Mark or David, yeah, if or I is could, that pretty yeah. accurate? No, I would say actually that is pretty accurate because Title 42 had to go, even if you thought all of these COVID measures, school lockdowns and all the rest of that baloney were necessary. Obviously, Title 42, even if it was 
even if it had a rationale, it, it was gone. It was going to have to go at some point. Frankly, it was long overdue. Um, what has replaced it, you're correct. And in fact, it's not just the replacement of Title 42. It's much of what the Biden administration has done over the past two plus years is, in fact, facially illegal. In other words, it's simply contrary to law. And let me just give you one, the, the basic underlying issue here. The immigration statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act, says that anyone who crosses the border illegally shall be detained until either they're sent home or they get some kind of status, like asylum, for instance. The only exceptions, there's two exceptions. One is they can be made to wait in Mexico for their hearing dates. That was what, um, that's in the statute. And the program that under Trump they came up with was called the Migra Migrant Protection Protocols. Remain in Mexico is the shorthand term everybody used for that. So in other words, instead of actually being locked up, you would be in Mexico and then they'd let you in when your hearing date came up. The other, the only option, the only other alternative to detaining someone in the law is you release them on what's called parole, which in the immigration business is different from criminal justice parole. What it means is the president gets to let into the United States people who are inadmissible. It was intended by Congress to be for very narrow purposes. If you had a medical emergency, um, say, or if you were going to testify in a trial, but you were a criminal and was illegal to let you in, the president had that little bit of wiggle room. He has used that wiggle room, which every president except Trump has, in fact, kind of pushed the envelope on. He's blown through the envelope. Biden has admitted under this parole program more than one million inadmissible aliens, illegal aliens, on top of another million that he's led into the country unlawfully on let them go under other pretenses. He has come up with his own immigration policy, contrary to the law, and there are multiple lawsuits uh, pending. Some of them he's already lost lawsuits. Um, and look, if you want to increase immigration, fine, make your case. That's what legislate. That's what a legislature is for. Um, this president has essentially come up with he's freelanced an entirely separate parallel immigration system that over since January of 2020, 2021, has let in more illegal immigrants released into the United States than legal immigrants who got green cards. The president has basically freelanced an entirely parallel, unlawful immigration system. And so far, he's gotten away with it. Uh, and that's, again, has nothing to do with how much immigration you think we need, what immigration we need, all that. Those are all legitimate debates. I hope we talk about some of those questions. The president doesn't get to do this. And what we're seeing in immigration, my last point here is, we're seeing a replication of what we've seen in foreign policy over the past, say, 50 years, where we have a kind of imperial presidency, where the president just sort of gets into wars and Congress doesn't have to declare war. We're right. seeing the same kind of thing happening over the past couple of years on immigration. It's been developing. Mm -hmm. Obama sort of moved partly in that direction. This president has gone full imperial presidency with regard to immigration. So, Mark, I tend to agree with you in general, uh, just on the general principle that Congress has abdicated its legisl legislative duties. No, it hasn't, actually. I don't mean to interrupt and, you, but yeah, they've made a decision by not changing things. That is I, the decision. Mark, that's but, exactly what I was going to say. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, while you were talking, Mark, I saw David shaking his head. I don't know if he was uh, agreeing with you and shaking his no, head. No, he's not agreeing situation. with me. I can guarantee well, you that. <laughs> well, I kind of no, figured no, as much. No, I was not agreeing with him. I'll right. Be, be so, David, go ahead. Uh, respond yeah, to Mark's I, know, I mean, on the parole statute, I mean, this statute has been around since the 1950s, and every president has used it in a very similar manner. So whether it's Hungarians under the Eisenhower administration fleeing a communist revolt there, I mean... You go down the list, Cubans under the Johnson administration. We've had this parole policy be used in a variety of different manners. What he's objecting to is now this administration is deregulating it 
it's not executive action to not keep someone out. Uh, that's a refusal. Re, re, that's the opposite of an executive action. The, the executive is acting less in a less regulatory manner by allowing more people the ability to immigrate legally. He calls them illegal immigrants, even when they enter the country legally after vetting. There, there's really no one at that point uh, who won't, wouldn't get that label. And in terms of the president acting illegally, I mean, the, the clearest example is the asylum ban that I talked about. I mean, that is the clearest overreach you could possibly have. He's saying is if someone crosses the border illegally, they are not eligible for asylum. The very first provision of the asylum statute says that anyone who enters the country in any manner, in any status, can apply for asylum. And yet the, the president of the United States, following his predecessor, President Trump, has decided we're just going to shred that statute, get rid of it, and we're going to deport people who, e who could even prove that they have persecution uh, in their home countries. Now, I was go I just want to, for the benefit, I feel like I'm the ombudsman for the audience. For the benefit of the audience, I am their representative. And we're using the phrase a lot, asylum. Asylum has a very specific meaning and a very somewhat rich history. And I like the concept of asylum, but just so the audience can follow the conversation, um, I'll ask David or Mark to just tell us what they mean by asylum in the context in which we're using it. Asylum was invented uh, legally by the United Nations in a 1951 treaty. Uh, it was uh, basically uh, something that was created in the context of the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War, or the beginning of that phase of the Cold War. Cold War started in 1917. But that part of the Cold War after World War II was the context within which asylum was created. We did not sign that treaty precisely because it significantly restricted American or anybody's sovereignty. In 1968, LBJ signed it along with all the other lamentable things that he signed and Congress and the Senate approved it. And what, what it does, what asylum is, is essentially that you get to be considered a refugee. Those are in our law, the same thing. You're somebody's persecuted. A refugee is someone we affirmatively go overseas and say, we're going to bring you to the United States. We decide, okay, you, for whatever reason that we decide, warrant being resettled, we bring you in. An asylee is a person who comes here, whether we like it or not, and tells us, regardless of what you, what your limits on immigration and your rules, you have to let me stay. It's a, it's a restriction on sovereignty in a way that refugee resettlement isn't. And what, when you qualify for it, the way you qualify is that you make the case that you have been persecuted or have a well-founded fear of persecution, that's the wording in the law, based on one of five criteria. Four of them are pretty clear. You're persecuted because of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. Okay, uh, the, I think most people get that. You can lie, there's wiggle room, but that's understandable. The fifth ground for asylum is the one really that causes so much problems both in Europe and Israel and Australia and in the United States, all of which are targets for illegal immigrants using asylum claims. The fifth ground for asylum is that you claim to have been persecuted based on membership in a particular social group, which means anything a left-wing judge or activist wants it to mean. And it is expanded to mean all kinds of things. And it is the, uh, as Justice Alito, when he was still a judge in the lower court, wrote, any two people could plausibly call themselves a social group. And so this particular social group gimmick, really, has been used as a way of um, turning asylum, which was originally intended for basically a handful of Russian ballerinas, into a vehicle for mass violation of immigration limits passed in the law. Again, whether it's here, Europe, Israel, or Australia, those are the four sort of places where asylum is the most biggest problem. And um, 
it's going to be fixed. And in a sense, the silver lining around the um, border crisis is that it is, that crisis is creating the political space for the kind of reforms and narrowing of asylum that we need in the modern world, because it's an anachronism that was put together a lifetime ago, and it needs to be uh, updated. David, you're going to need medication unless we let you speak. So to save you prescription dollars, <laughs> uh, what's your point of view on what uh, Mark just mentioned? Well, uh, asylum is extremely restricted under all laws. You know, for example, it doesn't include sex or gender. So women cannot, women who are persecuted in Afghanistan cannot qualify unless they qualify under the social group designation. So if we didn't have social group, then we wouldn't have anyone who's persecuted because they're a woman anywhere in the world would not qualify for asylum. So the whole idea, the premise here is that we need to have really restrictive asylum laws. Well, this is totally the opposite. We need to have asylum laws that are more fit to the reality of the crisis of today. I agree with that. They need to be updated. But when you're dealing with societal collapse in Venezuela, when you have a, a basically a prison island in Cuba off our coast, we should have refugee and asylum laws that reflect the reality that is that we have tyranny around the world and a lot of people want to get away from that tyranny. Our immigration laws should allow people to do that in a way that's legal and orderly and safe for them and beneficial for the United States. Our laws do not allow them to do that in a legal and safe and orderly manner. And if we, they did, we'd have it be in a much better situation all around. So there are, sounds- look, there are billions of people in the world who are oppressed. Uh, frankly, you know, to be honest, every woman in the third world has a good case to make that they're living in unjust circumstances. Um, are, do they all get to move here? This is what David's saying. And even when pollsters ask people, Gallup has actually asked people, would you want to move to another country? 800 million people around the world say yes, which is a plausible number because most people are never going to move. But 800 million people is a lot of people. Uh, the first country of destination was the United States. And if they couldn't go to other places, hundreds of millions of more would come to the United States. We need to have immigration limits. And if you think we should have higher immigration limits, okay, I mean, that's a, we'll let, I'm happy to debate that. I disagree, but we can debate that. But whatever the limit is, it needs to be enforced muscularly, without apology, and immediately. And none of those things are happening now, or do we have any, honestly, any uh, prospect of them happening under the current administration? Well, we do have immigration limits. It's called the market. If people can't uh, uh, afford housing in the United States, they can't afford a job, they don't come. And we've seen this throughout history, whether it's illegal immigration. We had essentially an unguarded border for most of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and illegal immigration ebbed and flowed with the market. Uh, The idea that just anyone will come, regardless of the circumstances in the United States, regardless of whether they can find housing or or uh, a a job, is just not reflective of the reality of the 19th and and early 20th century either. We've always had loads of people who have come across the border. We've always had a dynamic where unemployment was inversely correlated with immigration until we had these arbitrary immigration caps. I'm glad have, you're here that you're have, willing to consider. By the way, hundreds I don't know why you're talking right people. now. I, I'm, still, I'm still answering the question. Oh, but, hold on, hold on, the, guys. Let David finish. Yeah, go ahead, David. But, uh, but uh, I'm glad that you're willing to consider much higher immigration levels because that would do a lot to alleviate the many of the problems in our immigration system. I'm willing to compromise. We can come somewhere <laughs> between everyone has a right to come and uh, a much better immigration system that has a much more expansive uh, uh, group of people who can come legally to this country. There's uh, a third. Is, okay. One, okay. one quick point on this. Um, first of all, I want lower levels of immigration. I think that should be <laughs> obvious. I'm not going to yeah. be compromising on that. But yeah, yeah. the other thing is we have huge numbers of people who are being bused to New York and Chicago and all that stuff. Those are people who don't aren't coming because there's a job. They're not coming because they have relatives. They're becoming, they're coming because the gringos have opened the door and they want to get in before it closes. If you're living in Haiti, 
living on the street in the United States is a step up. So the idea that this is purely, uh, it's possible for it to be a purely economic market-driven phenomenon, first of all, isn't a good idea. Everything shouldn't be market-driven. That's why we ban heroin, for instance, and that's a separate debate. I'm not getting into that. That's a different show. But the fact is, it's not just about jobs. It's about order. It's about living in a society that isn't crumbling. And uh, huge numbers of people would come, regardless of economic circumstances. What we all- yeah, I, I just want to make like one point on that. So, <laughs> te te Texas, Texas has bust like twenty thousand people. We've had however many two two million 40, people. 000. Uh, okay, 30,000. I mean, it's a 40, tiny number. The idea that we're ever going to have a pure immigration policy and everything's going to, everyone's going to be perfect. They're all going to, obviously that's ludicrous. But the current situation is we have people showing up at the border because that's the only way to come. If we had a legal immigration policy that allowed people to come in a more lawful and orderly way, then they would. And that would be more reflective of the American. We've tradition. actually so, talked so I don't, I don't to wanna, people wanna, coming to the border. This, but, We've actually okay. talked to people coming to the border before they get to the lawyers, before they get to the activists. And we say, why are you coming? They said, well, because Biden said we could come. That's the only reason we left our homes. No, come no. because they can get in. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. so let's sure. I'm sorry. Let's let's take. Just, this is also fascinating, and as you guys were uh, volleying back and forth, there were so many issues that popped into my head. So let me, um, uh, trying to stay true to my own libertarian roots here, let me pose this question. What would be wrong? Uh, Mark, I kind of took uh, your statement as we can't have a free market with everything. There has to be some restrictions. Uh, being the good minarchist that I By am. By the way, I don't agree with that, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, let me throw that out. Not you, Bob. I meant Mark. Yeah. Uh, no, um, I... Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, go ahead. Make yeah. your point. <laughs> so my point is the following: um, for most of the U.S. history, we did have we had zero uh, immigration policy. There's certainly nothing in the Constitution referring uh, specifically to immigration policy, uh, and it really was market driven. Uh, immigrants came here because they were either starving in their own country, were really being put to death for their beliefs or or their religion or whatever. You know those asylum cases you rattled off, uh, Mark and David. Uh, if, in fact, the United States uh, is that sort of beacon, Im Im at every stage in our history, there have been immigrants who have been vilified for societal ills, right? Whether it was the Irish coming over, whether it was the Hessians who stayed here from the start, the Italians, whatever the case may be, the Japanese Americans during World War II. So, but in, in hindsight, we look back and we say it didn't work. It wasn't really that bad the United States really didn't suffer societally for it. So what would be wrong with a least restrictive possible policy saying, okay, we will have these ports of entry so we can check to make sure that we don't have armed uh, insurgents coming in or whatever the case may be, something very obvious. But short of that, let's not bother with five different types of asylum. Let's not work with these games that are going through the courts. As you said, Mark, shopping for the right leftist judge, I think you said, to say, yeah, you, the two of you form a, a group that qualifies for asylum. Just get rid of that and just say, anyone can come here. They, uh, if you want to say they need a sponsor or something to that effect, uh, make sure you're disease-free, make sure you don't have any weapons when you uh, come through the ports of entry. What in general would be wrong with a policy like that? Wouldn't the market eventually say, if we got too full, there are no jobs left? Because as it is, there's plenty of work in this country, and there's work for d shifting demographics, uh, say more manual labor or whatever. Typically, that's been something immigrants have flooded to. Uh, and then they work, you know, they tend to be good Americans in the sense that they assimilate. They tend to get good jobs. They add to the economy. What's wrong with a least restrictive policy possible? First, I would like to just offer a couple of observations, if I may, guys. Uh, first of all, we are so lucky right now because in my opinion we are going to learn with our own eyes and ears and other senses what's good immigration policy why do i say that this is in my view a magic moment for immigration why is it magical number one we're starving for labor believe it or not we are we are Every every retail store, 
We're hiring. We're starving for labor, partly because of the generous handouts during the COVID era. People have discovered the joys of of living without working, plus the fact we just have a shortage. And then, like magic, providentially, we are delivered a bunch of tens of thousands of illegal immigrants, I hate the phrase, uh, who are coming here, I presume, we'll see if I'm right, to work. And so their kids can be doctors or whatever. And they're now, right now, on the streets. We're like moments away from cities, states, and maybe even the federal government finding a way out of desperation to get these people into the workforce. And we are going to see statistically that the number of people living on the sidewalks and in school gymnasiums are going to decline. The number of workers who are integrated one way or another into the workforce, there. We are going to see the numbers all change for the better, and we will see what the right balance is. So we're going to actually be done with the theory. We're going to see what's going on and if these theories are right. Uh, the second point I just want to make is on the issue of asylum, what should be the rules? I find the whole concept, and I invite feedback, of course, from my colleagues here, the whole concept of asylum has a measure of hypocrisy. And here's what I mean. The principle of asylum, as Mark and David have explained it to us today, is that it is the humane thing to do to take somebody who is living a horrible life because of externalities, governments, or the like. And we owe it as part of our humanity to give them a shot at a better life. Well, I agree with that. But why these people have a bad life should not be restricted. Do you have to have a bad life for, life for the right reasons? It's like hate crimes. I know I will have arrived when the government says you get an enhanced sentence if you kill a lawyer. Then I will have, then I'm one of the cool kids. And now my life is now determined by government to be more valuable. So that's, <laughs> I hate it. I hate hate crime laws. And hate crime laws and asylum rules are the same. It's somebody's misery is more valuable than another person's misery. Screw it. If we're humane, we're humane. And all we require for asylum is you're going to be happier here. Now, to Mark's point, no, of course we can't say anybody who is unhappy can come here. We'll give you a psychological test. If you're depressed, you get a green card. No, I'm not suggesting that. But I'm suggesting that we, we can meet our own needs as well as their needs, they being the asylum seekers, by having very generous uh, immigration rules if we have individuals who will today contribute to our economy and our social structure, very generous, and as generous as we can be consistent with our self-interest, anybody who wants to come here because they're going to be better off, yes, but we have to limit it, not by nationality, not by countries in favor or disfavor at the moment as a matter of foreign policy. We limit it by practical reasons as fairly as we can do it. Everybody's needs get met. Mark, Mark's fear of open borders and whatever ills flow from that gets met because it's controlled by a, by a quota fairly administered. And the conservatives' needs are met because the country is better off by all those tests. And we're about to see, I think we're getting really close to that, miraculously, even without legislation. It's just happening because it has to happen, just like marijuana legislation. But it happened because it had to happen. If, 
But will we learn so, from it? Is the question? Is the bigger question? I don't care as long as we do it. As long as we do it, I don't care if we learn or not. Just do it. You're right. Okay, fair enough, Mark. Okay, so if I could system. basically answer John's question and Bob's comments to begin with, uh, Bob, uh, John, rather, yeah. um, immigration was limited during our history. It was limited by the oceans. Uh, we, you know, what's changed is not so much the immigrants. Somebody from you know, the Palatine in, South Ger in Southern Germany in the 1700s isn't really all that much different from some Honduran coming here today. Yeah, there are differences, but that's not really the main thing. The difference is the German can get here in about seven hours uh, in a way that simply wasn't possible in the past. The oceans limited immigration. There was no need for caps. As technology advanced, policy in fits and starts in often stupid ways responded to those changes in policy. And let me just get one point about the Constitution. This is something I hear often from libertarians. Constitution doesn't say anything about immigration, only about naturalization. It does say something about immigration. It says Congress may not limit the, the arrival of persons for servitude in other words, slaves, though the Constitution never uses the word slaves because they're people, uh, Congress can't limit the immigration of people for that purpose until 1808. That's, that, was, that was the slave trade thing. Well, it's pretty obvious that implicit in that provision is that Congress can, in fact, limit the arrival of people. It's just that they weren't limiting the arrival of people until that time for that reason. So the, the constitutional basis for immigration limits is frankly unquestionable by anybody who is uh, approaching it sincerely. But that's, but even those who say Congress has no right to limit immigration kind of say, well, Congress should do it anyway, because that's what we're talking about here. There should be limits. There should be rules. Well, if Congress isn't allowed to do it under the Constitution, then everything that you guys have been talking about is illegitimate and that, it, that coming into the United States should be no different from crossing the county line which is something uh, Professor uh, Brian Kaplan at George Mason University, the argument he makes. In fact, you shouldn't even be allowed to keep out people who have diseases right. or carry guns or whatever. I don't get right. checked when I cross from Fairfax County, Virginia, into the District of Columbia. Um, so that whole idea that constitutionally there's no basis for immigration limits is simply absurd. And it's not even, I mean, it, well, it shouldn't even be coming up. Well, but, to your point about the slave trade, just to interject, um, the key point there is you said, well, they're people. I would argue that they weren't considered people at that point. So the Constitution does. Slaves. That's why although, it never says Although slaves. I would say the, the 1808 statute was not ever drafted as an immigration statute. Right. It was drafted as a slavery statute. So to say it, it implies anything about immigration policy, I think is to misread that statute. Uh, so, the fact, the fact and also, it prohibited also, prohibited people from being from coming into persons from coming to the United States under certain circumstances. Also, That's I would invite I would invite my colleagues on this podcast to adopt an approach that when I when I do my radio show, I invite guests to do with respect to gun policy. It's, I have found just an observation that an issue such as immigration is much better discussed without reference to the Constitution and with reference to never mind the Constitution for the minute. What should be our policy will then devise a good policy and then test it against constitutional limitations. It's a much more interesting conversation, in my opinion, to just discuss how we feel about the subject. I, 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 actually, I actually agree with that. I do think the history of the Constitution is interesting. I think James Madison actually disagreed with Krikorian's take on, on the, uh, the migration and uh, importation clause, but that's, we can set that aside. The, the, Thank you. The, the interesting part of what he said was that history, you know, history drove the, the change in immigration policy from uh, a, a more open policy to basically what 
Mark is advocating for here, which is almost everyone is excluded from around the world. And that's totally ahistorical. That's not what happened. The Immigration Act of 1924 was not driven by some practical considerations that, oh, America was full in 1924, even though our population has doubled since then. That's nonsense. That's not what happened. The elites of the United States became enamored with eugenics theories about race. It was about race. That's what drove the change in policy. It had nothing whatsoever to do with practical considerations. And the, the idea that we would go back and look at that policy that was driven by race as the example, we should go back to that type of policy that excludes the vast majority of people is not in the interest of the United States. And there's not a practical case for it. There's a practical case for expanding immigration right now when U.S. birth rates are declining. Labor force growth rate has declined every single decade since the 1960s. It's gone down. It's now over 60 percent lower than what it was in the 1960s and 1970s. And we need more people uh, for a variety of occupations and skill sets across a variety of different uh, types of, uh, of labor. And right now in this exact moment in time, we've never had this many job openings as we have over the last two years. So the idea that we should be restricting immigration right now, it just, it makes no sense. There's not an economic case for it. And it's ahistorical to say that that's what drove immigration policy. It has never drawn, drove immigration policy. It's always been about non-economic factors. The now, 1924 that, I... immigration law, which was a follow-up from the 1921 law, was in fact partly based on these sort of bogus racial ideas of Nordic and Alpine and what have you, all that stuff. That was, in a sense what shaped the way they restricted immigration with these dumb national origin quotas. You know, this many Irish could come in, but only that many Greeks could come in or what have you. The impetus for it was much broader. It was the result of a huge study conducted by what's called the Dillingham Commission in 1911, which was uh, an economic analysis. There were progressives who were for it for non-economic reasons, for sort of social reasons, there was a broad, the reason it passed. And remember, immigration restrictions passed repeatedly in Congress, year after year after year, and were vetoed by presidents, both Republican and Democrat, for something like 30 years before immigration was finally reduced. It was never cut off, but it was reduced. Um, there were a variety of of social forces, all of which came together. And the sort of the thing that just, and this matters for understanding, um, you know, where we are now, the reason the immigration law actually passed was that a large enough number, a large enough portion of business agreed to, cons agreed to accept the higher wages they would have to pay as a result of immigration restriction because of the Bolshevik revolution and the anarchist movements. So, so it are always immigration restriction for 30 years had been stopped by big business uh, from the 1890s to the 1920s. They finally agreed, some of them did, enough to sort of get it over the hump because they figured, okay, I'll pay five cents extra an hour to my factory workers in order not to be killed in my bed by anarchists. That was but, simplifying it. That's why it happened. It took the form it did because of these stupid racialist ideas that were prevalent at the David, time. David, I know, I, I know what you're about to say, I think, but I want to tee up your response um, <laughs> with what I would find, this is selfish on my part, an interesting response from my three co-participants. And... If we start with the premise, and I think we all can agree, that nobody is proposing, as I used to say, let them all in. It just doesn't work. Too many people. Um, you can't just say everybody in the world can come here. Um, more than one. So we, we start with the agreement that whatever we may like morally, it can't work. It's impossible. So now there has to be some governing principle or two which governs something that a policy that 
less than let them all in. Now, I'd be interested in hearing from each of my three colleagues identify the one or the two governing principles that would govern immigration policy once you back off from let them all in. In the extreme is let nobody in. Nobody is proposing that. So what should be the governing policy, not the specific policy, but the the top of the line policy uh, to hear from each one of you. And then we can sort of in our head, imagine legislation flowing from these principles. And I suspect the principles are each going to be different from each one of you. Uh, now, Ma- David, I interrupted you. Uh, so w- help our audience understand from your standpoint, what should be the governing principles, one or two, that drive immigration policy? Look, the U.S. government exists exists to protect the, the liberties of Americans. And the that same principle applies in the immigration context. I would subject all immigration laws to the same scrutiny we treat all other laws in the United States. We should not have the, the presumption should be on the government to prove why a certain person should not be allowed to immigrate to this country. It should be innocent until proven guilty. That is the tradition of the United States. And that's entirely eviscerated in the immigration law context. The, take a, an example of immigration that Mark and I agree on, and it's probably the only one. I should be able to marry someone in a foreign country, and that person should be able to immigrate to live with me in the United States. I think Mark would agree that that's a fine type of immigration. But even in that context, our immigration laws right now put the presumption on the immigrant to prove that they have that right, and they haven't done anything that would potentially jeopardize that right. And they can put any conditions they want on that union and they have. So if uh, they violated immigration law before, they can be banished forever uh, from from the country. And, and our union can never exist legally in the United States. Uh, if they don't have a if I don't have a certain high enough wage, they, they that person can't come uh, again. So the presumption should always be on the government. And I just take one example, one story a U.S. citizen who uh, reached out to me recently, U.S. citizen, a veteran of the armed services, married someone from Europe. Tried, they came over together. Uh, she was on a, a, you know, the right to travel visa waiver program. They got stopped at the airport. They said, you know, is she your spouse? You said, well, my fiance, we're, we're about to get married. They said, ban, you're gone. You can't, you can't come in. You have to go home and prove to us over a two year process that you are in fact planning to marry them and you have the right and you have the visa. So they went through a two year banishment because of this policy that Mark uh, is trying to but, voice but on David, the your, your, your story is anecdotal. I'm talking more big picture for the benefit of our listeners. Well, it's to exemplify a principle that the presumption should be on the government to show why this person is going to be harmful to the United States, not on the individual to prove their liberty to the government. What about statistically? Um, I'm just a sentence or two, David, then I want to hear from, I'd like to hear from Mark and and from Big John. Statistically, should there be a number? Should it be based upon economic conditions? Should it be based upon housing? How should the government draft legislation or the principles governing legislation short of anybody who wants to come in can come in because that simply can't work. So what should... Well, it's a, it's a, it's a principle basis. Uh, I think we should our, our government should be based on principle, not arbitrary quotas, Soviet-style caps. Uh, th- that's not part of the American tradition whatsoever. Our government should act based on principles, not on uh, some kind of Soviet-style system. As I said earlier, the market will regulate and has, and we've had many examples that we can point to both in the past and recently 
of the market regulating immigration. Even 2020 is a great example of the market regulating immigration. We saw a massive decline in the number of people coming to the border because there weren't any jobs in the United States in the summer of 2020. When the jobs came back and they came back double the level they were before, we saw twice as much immigration in 2021 as we saw in 2019. And it's driven by jobs. So when jobs are available, people come. And when they're not, people don't. Mark, what's your perfect immigration policy principles? Right. Yeah, I think this is this is actually an excellent question. And David articulated his point of view, which if I could put it this way, I don't think I'm putting words in his mouth. Everyone in the world gets to move here except for those people we make specific exceptions for. My principle is the exact opposite. No one gets to move here except for those people we make exceptions for. I mean, that is kind of the the um, that's the real difference between conservatives, really almost everybody. And on the one and hand, what would be your what would be the bullet, the examples of the exceptions? The um, so what I the way I think about it is not zero immigration, but zero based budgeting in immigration. A modern society like ours, with a third of a billion people that spans a continent and invented modernity, doesn't actually need any immigration. But there are the exceptions of people who do have a case to be let in. My first category would be, as David pointed out, spouses and minor children of U.S. citizens. Uh, There's a lot of fraud there, a lot of lying. That's why there's these various rules around it. I mean, there's enormous amounts of fraud. But if it's legit, you have every right to expect that if you marry someone abroad or adopt a baby, you should be able to bring that person into the United States with relatively little fuss and bother. Um, But that's a lot of people already. That's 350, 400,000 people a year now. Uh, Second category sort of exception I would make would be Einstein immigration, people who are the top people in their fields in the world. And unfortunately, we have a system for that already, but it includes, it it casts the net, in my opinion, too wide. You can argue about where that should be. And frankly, even some people who were admitted as, you know, exceptional talents and abilities. I know one guy who got in on what's called an E1 visa, you know, technically the Einstein visa. He's a great guy. It's not Einstein. I'm sorry. So, but again, that would be exception. Einstein immigration and humanity doesn't produce that many Einsteins in any given year. And then the third category is humanitarian immigration, refugees and asylum, which I think needs to be much more restrictive than it is now. Even refugee resettlement, I consider to be on the most, uh, the vast majority of refugee resettlement is immoral. It's actually morally wrong because we spend, we've actually done the numbers on this, we spend 12 times as much to resettle a refugee, this is from the Middle East particularly, as it takes to support that person in the country where they've taken their first refuge, like a Syrian in Turkey, for instance. What that means is each refugee we bring here represents 11 other people whom we are not helping with those resources, and resources are not unlimited. And so even in humanitarian immigration, I think it needs to be significantly reduced. You put all that together, you have not zero immigration, but maybe 400,000 or so a year. That's more than any other country takes for regular permanent immigration. I don't mean Saudi Arabia importing slave labor. I mean, actual people who will have the right to be and should be expected to become American citizens. But it's, you know, 60 percent less than the million or million plus, depending on the year that we take now. Big John. But the, but oh, the principle, but the principle, again, I think it's clear. It's good for listeners to get the idea. David and libertarians in general say everyone in the world has a right to move here, except those okay. people we say no. Wait, wait, let me ask. Mark, Mark big... doesn't need to lay out my position for me any, any further. I mean, he says it's a lot of people, 400,000 people. That's like a tenth of the U.S. population, a tenth of a percent of the U.S. population. This is a tiny 
laughably small number. And it would be far less than that, because if we didn't have immigrants, there would be far fewer spouses of, of, of uh, people who are, have U.S. citizenship. So it would be way less than 400,000 per year. No, you look at Canada, just... Canada, wait, wait, Canada they just... has an illegal immigration rate that is three times what our current rate is, which is a third of a percent of the population. They're much smaller country. We are a much bigger country, so we can have a much bigger immigration policy yeah. with much smaller uh, uh, effects. So the, the, the reality of the situation land, is far frankly. different from what, what's uh, <laughs> being laid out here. But the, the really funny part of this is the, the idea that only Einsteins are going to be an economic benefit to the country. I mean, just take, for example, I mean, so almost 90 percent of the, the U.S. population does not have an advanced degree. So forget about being an Einstein. 90% of the US population does not have an advanced degree. Are all of those people an economic net negative to the country that we'd be better off if we had just 10 those 10% who are, have an advanced degree? No, there are lots of people who can be economic benefits without being Einstein. And so the, the idea that we our immigration policy should be based on what the government thinks who the next Einstein is gonna be I don't trust the government to figure that out, first of all. Uh, and and he, apparently Mark doesn't either because he's pointing to someone who apparently uh, is, an, is an Einstein according to the government, but he doesn't think they are. Big At the end of the day, our U.S. policies should be based on what's good for the country. And what's good for the country is more Americans, a, a larger country with more people who are producing more things of value for others is the best policy for the United States. Big John, uh, what would be your limiting rules if you agree with me that let them all in doesn't work? What would be your main principles of limitation? Oh, to me, it's uh, the very, uh, I would say everyone should be able to move here if they so desire. Having someone decide who is a preferred group for inclusion, I think will never work. Uh, the politics of that make it completely repugnant to me as someone who just sees people as having basic human rights to, to but improve do their you life. favor do you favor let them all in and we'll deal with it? No, be, uh, it, to the extent So what would that, be your limitation? My limitation would be defined by the market because no one person or, or, or cabal of people knows what those limits are. I heard the number 400,000 from Mark. I heard other or 40,000, whatever the number was. I don't know what the right number is. And, and I work with data every day of my life. And I couldn't tell you what the right number is. I couldn't tell you, uh, I mean, to David's point, you look around, something like 90% of our hard science PhDs are either immigrants in this country or children of immigrants. So when you're talking about Einstein visas, to the extent that they, that could even be defined, I would say grab them all up, not just wait for them to apply to this country for immigration, go actively recruit them to come to this country. The same goes for anyone who's willing to come here and make a better life for themselves. To the extent that some may argue they're coming here for benefits, they're coming here for welfare, they're coming here for handouts, which by the way, statistically isn't even the case. Immigrants take less out of the system than they put in. But even if you were to use that as an excuse, like I don't... My answer would be correct the welfare system, correct the nanny state, correct the overrich government. It already right? is corrected. Right? So my my whole point is anyone who comes – the only restriction I would have is you're not a criminal. You're not any sort of revolutionary to the extent that you're here for the purpose of uh, 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 taking down the government for lack of a better term. But to the extent that we will put arbitrary restrictions based on the quality of the character of, of potential immigrants – I mean, I, I personally, who would have known that my father was qualified to be an immigrant to this country my, my, uh, when he came over, right? So, and I, and all of us, for the most part, I would think, have that story in their history, in their family tree somewhere, right? Uh, now, do you want to have some requirement like immigrants should be required to become naturalized within a fixed period of time? No, that's reasonable to me. I don't know if it is or it isn't, but if that were the case. Fair enough. You know, I could see that because then people are making the decision to come here. It's not the government saying thou shalt not enter. It's it's like, well, I don't want to trade moving to the U.S. And the price is that I have to become a natural. Like if you can't commit to that, that's fine. Stay away. 
But if you could commit to that, then go ahead and come in. So that's my position. I don't think I'm against any government agency or people making decisions arbitrarily as to who qualifies for any sort of. I think some worldwide so context. I think some worldwide context is important here too, because we hear about how the U.S. policy is super extreme, and we have more immigrants than anywhere else in the world. Well, we're the third largest country in the world, so you have to control for the population size when you're doing these types of comparisons, which Mark doesn't want to do. But if you look at it by population size, the United States. The United States ranks in the bottom third of countries for foreign born share of the population. That's both legal and illegal. So we're getting this extra credit for having all these people who we didn't even want to let in in the first place uh, into our society. So if we really want to. So Canada, over 22 percent of its population is foreign born in Australia. It's over 30 percent of its population is foreign born. Switzerland, 30 percent. There are many other countries most developed countries, in fact, have a much higher share of the population. And just look at the states. I mean, is Florida going to into some disaster territory right now because 17 percent of its population is foreign born? Uh, no, it's 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 not. And in fact, most states throughout their history have had a much higher share at some point than the national average for the United States. So the idea that we're full, we have an extreme policy right now. It's just not true. I'm going to speak well, on behalf of, of uh, I'd like to speak on behalf of two different groups of silent majority who have been given short shrift in this discussion. Mark, uh, in your presentation, there's a huge group that you left out of your standards. Just an observation. Once you grab all the Einsteins, and once you grab all of the asylum seekers who are being persecuted, so those groups get to the front of the line. Who doesn't get in is a hardworking, entrepreneurial, middle class person who is locked in a job where they can't make any money. It's no hope. Perhaps it's something akin to a caste system. They they are destined never to prosper. That group doesn't fall into any category and it's huge. And it breaks my heart if we have a policy that they can't come here and open up a store. Just an observation. And you can, I'll, I'll pause in a second. The second group that I want to defend or advocate for is there is a, a principle that has been given, in my opinion, short shrift, a principle. And the principle is that humans have an inherent right to travel. It's part of their humanness. We recognize that within our borders, we don't limit state to state travel. It's that principle. And we all, I dare say, it's presumptuous of me to speak for everybody else, but I think I can somewhat accurately. We acknowledge that in general, there is a right to travel. And the, the principle that I was asking others about is no one seems to recognize that as a governing principle. David, you came close. Let them all in except. So I just want to speak out that I am profoundly driven by that principle, I've often observed that one of the principles of our country is the abhorrence of peerage. It's in the Constitution. We reject peerage. Peerage means an advantage because of the accident of birth. That's what it means. We have a system of peerage where we give special status to those person who, those humans who by accident of birth were born here. Well, I dare say somebody born in Haiti is as worthy of a shot at a good life as me, just because my parents, their parents are in Haiti. And I, I find it painful to give so much privilege to people who, by dint of the accident of birth, they get to enjoy a life others don't. And I just want to invite our audience, as we sort of wind down, to 
hopefully pay attention to the rights of fellow humans who deserve the same shot we are given, not by dint of our own skill, but who our parents were. That's all. Bob, now, if I could just make the please, point that I know you're please. wrapping up here, but the fact is, I think what you're overlooking is not, obviously everybody has basic human rights because we're all human beings and we're equal in the eyes of God. But we have what one philosopher calls concentric circles of responsibility. We have a greater responsibility to our children than to our neighbors. And we have a greater responsibility to our fellow countrymen than to foreigners. And the fact is that in a, um, in, By the way, I don't system. agree with that. Uh, just okay. I, I, I don't necessarily. I concede the first part, not the second. But please continue. The the <laughs> the premise of self government is that the government that we have instituted among ourselves has a responsibility to pursue our interests, not the interests of others necessarily. So we government exists in order to secure, in order to, as the Constitution says, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, uh, ensure domestic tranquility, and then I forgot the other one, um, for (laughs) ourselves and our posterity. The very premise of democratic government is that it exists for for we, the people of that polity, Rather than for humanity as a whole, and Try you can argue but, but any that, kind of that pers- immigration policy based on but that. Just real quick, but it has to be quickly. something that is in the interest of Americans, not something that is sort of objectively applies to everybody in the world. Real quickly, there's a presumption built in there that the people who are coming here won't be part of us, and that's wrong. They will be part of us. They will become part of our polity. And, they, sure. and their future as Americans should be something that we celebrate and consider as something valuable. Uh, but they're on, not on, here yet. That's well, the point. no, they, we will, get be, to they decide. will be, if not for our law. It's just like the baby. We get to decide our posterity, who comes our posterity, here. You had your moment. Our, our posterity is not born yet. They're not here either. But they have value, too. And they should be taken into consideration in our policies as well. All right, gentlemen, this has been a great conversation slash discussion slash argument but no unfortunately argument. No argument. Uh, it, it's coming to an end i want to thank all of our guests and as i uh, uh introduce them I'd, a- I'd ask for them to give us their social media handles to the extent that they want our viewers to follow them so let's start with uh david beer of the cato institute david underscore j underscore beer on twitter there you go mr mark krikorian of the Center for Immigration Studies. Our website is cis.org. And if you have a taste for snark and sarcasm, my uh, Twitter handle is Mark S, as in Stephen, Mark S. Krikorian. And certainly with an appetite like mine, I'm sure I'll be following you, Mark, and I'll look to hold you to your snarkiness uh, 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 content quotient. So that uh, I'm looking forward to that. And finally, my friend and... uh, uh, radio legend there for libertarians, Mr. Bob Zadek, who also has a book coming out called Make Immigration Legal Again, Challenging Assumptions and Advocating for the Founders' Original Immigration Policy of Open Borders, available on Amazon. Go ahead, Bob. Mark, I'm going to give you one closing comment, which is oh, unfair no. of me because you don't have time to respond, but I'm taking advantage of that. Um, <laughs> when you recited um, have a duty to fellow Americans and our Constitution refers to our posterity, I wish that was our foreign policy. Uh, I would love that as foreign policy. We have no business in any other country because it's not benefiting Americans. That big John is for another show. Okay, yes, Mark, is, you have no chance to respond. That <laughs> I was a I was a bully, and I'm sorry about it. Bob at bobzadik.com is how one can reach me. And of course, for. Uh our regular viewers, join us again next time at uh, Free For All, FFAshow.com, FreeForAllShow.com. You see the address right there. Until next time, this is Big John alongside Bob Zadek. Come here again. We can't wait to see you. <laughs>